Just let me tell you a little bit about uh, Derek before we get going. Uh, Derek uh, launched back in 2013 a company called Ad Venue, dealing with over 7,000, have I got that right, artists? It's about 8,000 now. 8,000 artists, okay, well, I got my information yesterday, so you're growing pretty quickly. Um, and 200,000 shows and events that, that you've been involved with. And of course, that wasn't where you started, but this is where you are right now. Uh, tremendous success story. Thank you very much. Yeah, Alan. and, and uh, <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about this because, uh, first of all, I, I just gave a, a top shelf view of, of what you do. Give me a, a deeper view about what occupies your day when you walk into the office and get this thing going every day. Sure, thank you very much. Uh, I'm definitely, and I've lost a bit of my voice last night. I went to too many of these pubs, unfortunately, and it, I left yeah, my so voice behind in one of them. So I'll try not to croak too much while I, while I talk here. <clears throat> but uh, so my day, really, the, my role in a company, and uh, uh, I like, as I, for the folks who heard this yesterday, I like the earliest stages. I like it when somebody has an idea and does not know how to get that idea to become reality. And I've been very fortunate in my career that uh, I've done that several times now with uh, either ideas of my own or ideas of my co-founders. And uh, at Venue came about uh, when uh, uh, one of my co-founders, who is a long-time music industry guy, said, you know what, artists are having trouble making ends meet these days. Uh, they don't make money off their albums anymore. And uh, uh, it's really all about selling tickets and selling merchandise. And there's 400 companies trying to help them sell tickets, and their merchandise business is a disaster. So we jumped in on and uh, started talking about that. So back to your question, what do I do every day? That's how I start my day, is always thinking about why did we do this? <laughs> what are we up to? Right. You mentioned earlier today about uh, you know, having your mission up on the wall. Uh, that's a great place to start every day, is why are you getting out of bed? <laughs> and yeah. what are you going to do when you walk in those doors? But I look at my role as being an enabler. You know, I've got a tremendous team, and the team starts off very small and it gets bigger over time. But my job is to remove obstacles and barriers so my team can be successful at what they want to do and why they get out of bed every day. Uh, and I think that uh, when you are a founder of a company, that changes depending on what the needs are of any given day. Uh, and so some days I'll be out there trying to figure out how do I raise capital. <laughs> Other yeah. days I'll be in there thinking about how do I get that important customer to commit to, the, to, to working with us. Uh, other days it might be, hey, we've just run into a great individual that we really want to hire. Uh, how do we get her on board? <laughs> and right. so looking at these types of, so each day is a different, um, and maybe a multitude of these things, but it's all about you know, solving problems. You mentioned the fact that this was not your first rodeo, that you've been involved in other things before. And when you just now talked about how you came up with the concept uh, for, for this venture, it sort of goes to the heart of what everybody in this project is doing, people watching it uh, are thinking about, and that is when you have an idea like you did, you had to figure out how you move that along, how you scale up, how you, how you make an idea into a real thing. You've had a lot of experience doing that. Have you got anything to pass on to these folks? Uh, well, one of the things that I'd say is that Everybody has ideas, and everybody has this ability to see things around that they think could be better. And the entrepreneur is the person who seizes on that idea and chooses to do something about it. And so I think it's really inspiring to see the teams here doing everything they're doing because they're, they saw something they thought was broken that they wanted to address, and they're pursuing that and seizing that. So if it's really a matter of not just having the idea, but taking the steps towards making that idea real. Uh, the very early stages of that are validating it. You know, so you have this idea. Is it really a good idea? <laughs> How are you yeah. going to test that idea? Uh, and I'm a big fan of what, what's called the MVP, the minimum viable product. So if you're, uh, in fact, I test most of my ideas without even building any products. We will, you know, fake it <laughs> on some pieces of paper, uh, make PowerPoint <laughs> slide decks that look like they're a product, and we go talk to customers. We go talk to people that, that need this problem solved and ask them, would this solve your problem if we built it? Uh, another thing that I'm a believer in for, for commercial projects, when they're actually trying to become businesses, is people need to vote with their wallets. Uh, I've seen a lot of companies get started and say, well, we're going to uh, uh, just give it away and hopefully get a whole bunch of people on our platform. 
but somebody at the end of the day has to pay for the salaries and the servers and everything else that are involved. So find something that not just solves a problem, but if you want to be sustainable, find an economic model that's going to help you to actually accomplish your goals as well. Uh, I've, one of the things that's been great about hearing some of the teams here is a lot of them are thinking about how do I not just rely on people giving me money? How can I actually make my project self-sustaining so that it can generate its own uh, outcome? So you know, when, you want, when you have an idea, validate it, test it, and then figure out how, it, you know, how it's going to stay alive no matter what. Let me ask you, you know, we, we talk about the positives and what you must do, but nobody who's successful in this world, especially the technology world, uh, nobody who's successful hasn't failed at least once, twice, or three times. Uh, so why is failure important or as important as success? I think uh, I've heard a few interesting quotes on that. I don't remember if it was Einstein. I, hope, I attribute this quote to you. He said, uh, wisdom comes from having done everything wrong the first time. <laughs> and there is no question that uh, every, I've, I've built several businesses now, and everybody goes, oh, it should be easy by now, isn't it? And it's like, no, it's never easy. Uh, and I just make new mistakes every time I do one. Uh, and so don't be afraid to make mistakes, because that is how you are going to get out there and be successful. Uh, it's uh, uh, the way that you're going to learn what you want to do, and if you're doing it right, is you know, you're going to get knocked down, and you've got to get back up. You're going to get knocked down, and you're going to get back up. Uh, and I think that's really important. In fact, I love seeing there's quite a few uh, schools who've come out here today, and I think it's a great message that I would like to make sure that the, the, uh, the students and the kids here are, you just got to try, and when you fall down, you, you do it again. I, I actually had my first money-making venture when I was probably about the same age as some of the kids that I see sitting out here. I used to catch snakes in my backyard in Kelowna and take them to school in an ice cream pail and sell them to kids at le recess for a buck a snake. <laughs> and they would let them go and I would go catch the snakes again after and repeat the process. <laughs> Until the yeah. lid came off the bucket in my locker and that was uh, <laughs> the day that the school shut down my little <laughs> snake business. But one of the things that, is, that I think that we're doing a much better job of now that they didn't when I was in school uh, and when I went to university is we taught we, uh, I was taught to be a good employee at an oil company. I went to the University of Calgary. <laughs> and that was just not how I was wired. Mm. And I see now that a lot more focus in the schools on entrepreneurship, that it's OK to not just come out of school and go be an employee. So I think it's great to be an employee and learn that. But if you have that entrepreneurial uh, attitude, go do it. You know, step out, do, build your own business. There's, there's no better time than, uh, than when you're young and excited and uh, energetic. You talked about needing, you know, the most important thing you need on a startup is validation to make sure that the brilliant idea that you've got is actually at least a good idea in somebody else's eyes. What's the single greatest mistake you can make? Believing your own BS. Uh, <laughs> because I've seen an awful lot of startups as well convince themselves that, this, that their problem is real because they feel it's real. But the rest of the world doesn't necessarily believe that. Uh, but I think that the best thing, uh, this is a, the, the biggest mistake you can make is just not tuning into the messages that your, your community and your customers are giving you. Most businesses that are alive today are not successful with the product they started off making. Whatever they started doing really got them out into the world. And when they got out into the world and started really trying to make a go of it is when they really realized what they should be doing. And so almost always, companies will pivot or adjust what they're doing towards what they, they, they learn is a better opportunity or a bigger need. And so don't, don't believe, <laughs> you know, don't drink the Kool-Aid. You have to drink enough Kool-Aid <laughs> to, to get, to get, get out, up willing morning, to get yeah. up and go and do it. But pay attention to when you've drunk too much Kool-Aid yeah. <laughs> and need to make adjustments. So what's interesting about the teams that are operating here is that for the duration of this project, they're raising capital, trying to raise capital online, a little like a GoFundMe operation. Uh, but for anybody else doing a startup, in your experience, the funding, of course, is the key element to all of this. Where do you go for funding? Uh there's a lot of focus, I think, especially on the technology in, in the innovation world of venture capital financing. Ben, who will be up on the panel here with us shortly, said yesterday, that's not always the right fit. But yet we seem to think as 
early you know, first-time entrepreneur is that that's, that's going to be the, the secret. I remember when I was building one of my first companies and I was living in Calgary and uh, was invited to present my company at the BAM Venture Forum. And I thought, this is great. I'm going to whirl in there. I'm going to give my pitch. Someone's going to write me a check for a couple million bucks and I'm off to the races. Yeah. And it was a harsh wake-up call <laughs> when I walked in there and nobody wrote me a check. Uh, and I really had to step back and realize, why not? <laughs> you know, what, uh, uh, is, is my idea terrible? Is my, and it was because I was going after the wrong money for the stage and time that I was at in my business. So you don't usually, right out of the gates, run and pitch a, a venture capitalist. Mm -hmm. And your, your idea might not even be the right fit for a venture capitalist. So you really need to understand your business, its economic model, and what kinds of money you should be seeking. Most of the time, your first money is what we call the love money. That's gonna come from your friends and family. They're gonna give you money because they love you, not because they believe in your business or they're gonna get a huge return. Well, out. they love you now. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and professional investors like to see you have taken some love money because they don't want, they know that Christmas dinner is gonna be very uncomfortable <laughs> if you screw it up. Uh, but then you, so you, you need to get a little bit of that just to help you pay the bills, get things started, incorporate your business. Uh, and then you can go out after seed or angel money because they have a different threshold of what they're looking for. And angels for, are generally high net worth individuals. They don't have investment committees. They don't, they're not going to do as deep a due diligence, but they're going to buy into your passion and your vision of what you're trying to accomplish. And if they buy in, they will usually write you a check five, ten, twenty-five, fifty thousand uh, dollars and you'll get a handful of those who are buying into your vision. That's also good validation. Somebody who has been successful just thinks that whatever you're doing has, has potential. And then once you get that, then you can move into seed and if appropriate venture capital uh, and growth capital, private equity later on in the stage of the business. One of the other things, and you're a good example of it, is in startups, you know, the traditional, it's becoming the traditional biography of the truly successful folks in that field is that he started this business in 2001 and then he sold it in 2003 and then started this in 2004. In other words, the question becomes, how long do you stick at something? Uh, it's not like the old economy where you'd start something and the next five generations of your family would be involved in the business. Now it seems that it's, it, you know, the event horizon on all these things is, is fairly short. Uh, I think that's very true. The, there's, uh, uh, because the public markets uh, have not been very friendly to tech companies recently, although it's getting better now, we've yeah. got a few uh, more improvements, uh, generally the path to actually getting return on your investment, and that's if, if you're a founder, that might just be your time, but if, uh, your investors are going to want their money back and hopefully more at some point. The most common way that happens now is through an M&A transaction. So if you've built something that's of value, someone else will pay you for it. And so uh, I used to joke that uh, really I have, I have one product and I have to sell it one time. <laughs> and it's the company. Uh, but if you want to create a sustainable tech technology uh, cluster, like uh, uh, I know Kingston, we were having some discussions about that earlier, is how do you make that happen? You do need some anchors that are in it for the long haul. You need the Shopify's that are, that are helping to uh, you know, fuel what's going on in Ottawa right now. And, and, and there have been others before that, between you know, Nortel in the past. Uh, so you do need some that are going to be around for the long haul as well. But most of them will not turn into a Shopify. Most of them will get acquired by a Shopify. Yeah. Uh, and so, the, so that, yes, the event horizon is definitely shorter. But I don't think it's as short as people realize. Most tech companies that you suddenly see as being an overnight success spend a lot of years trying to get there. Airbnb spent an awful lot of time making no money and struggling. There were, there were several years before all of a sudden it took off for them. Uh, and so you, by the time they hit the radar of most people in the, in the public eye, they've been grinding it out for three, four, five, six, seven years under the hood. Uh, and so I think some entrepreneurs think, I'll go get, jump into this. Uh, I will build something for two or three years, it'll be successful, I'll get bought. From my experience, it's usually a five to seven year commitment on every one of these you launch. Uh, so you should expect that going in, that you're going to be, this is going to be your sole focus for half to three quarters of a decade. Do you manage differently if you've built to sell as opposed to build to keep? I think that's one of the lessons I've learned having gone through this a few times is if you build it to sell it, you're probably not going to be successful. 
So you ultimately have to build a good business. You have to, it has to have good customers and good economics. If all you're thinking about is, how am I gonna sell this in five years? You're focused on the wrong things. You really need to be focused on what's gonna make the, the people who are coming and giving me their business, how am I gonna make them successful? Because if you make them successful and you build a good business and, there's, and the economics sustain it, then there will be a lot of people suddenly interested in your business. But if you think that I just need to get big enough that someone's gonna buy me, you are, you're probably gonna miss the ball. When do you know when it's time to leave an idea or to leave a project or to leave a company because it's not working? Because every entrepreneur believes to their bootstraps that if I just push on one more day, it's really going to work. And it's the problem with entrepreneurs. The good ones know when it's time to drop something and move on to plan B. And the ones who fail tend to be the ones who stick with something a little bit too long. But how do you recognize that point? So uh, an excellent question and, and a tough, tough one to answer. <laughs> uh, it's not that there's a set of rules that you can follow or, and I'm definitely guilty of, of persisting with things too long, especially earlier in my career. But one of the mantras that I've heard very quickly, and one of my favorite leaders in innovation is Jeff Bezos of Amazon. And he believes a few things, start faster, fail faster. Uh, he says, when you, when, you, when you feel you have 70% of the information you need in order to know whether you should do something, you've already waited too long. You should have been going already. <laughs> so, uh, and he said, but go hard, and if it's not working, quickly scrap it and move to something else. So I think that uh, you get, your gut's going to tell you pretty quickly it's not working. And when you get into trouble is when you don't listen to that. When you really believe, because your brain overrides your gut. <laughs> and so I've learned that uh, my gut's been a pretty reliable indicator, and if something's not working, I need to shift gears quickly for a few reasons. You have limited resources. You are burning through with the capital and the goodwill and the energy of your team, and if you're ultimately not getting traction with it, you need to move on. And so traction is, if I was gonna look for an indicator, it's traction. Mm -hmm. I had a chance to, to chat with the founder who was up here yesterday from Scent Trunk, and he was walking me through kind of his business, and later, much later in his, his deck, he told me that, hey, in February, we kind of got out with our product. Uh, we now have 2,000 customers. We had 1,000 the first month, 2,000 the second month. It's like, whoa, what? You're telling me that in two months, you've gone from 1,000 customers the first month to 2,000 the next month. I said, do you think that's sustainable? He goes, yeah, I think we're going to you know, keep growing that. It's like, that is unbelievable because you have no idea how hard that is to do. And that is your leading indicator that you're on to something real because he doesn't just have customers. They're paying him. They're voting with their wallets. So if, if he had launched that and said, well, we've got it out for two months now and, uh, and we only have four people that bought, that's, the, that's your gut saying and that's the evidence saying, hmm, something's not right. I'd be interested in your perspective on where you set up and where you operate. Uh, there's no question that for some lucky startups who all of a sudden you know, the Valley calls and says, yeah, we're willing to invest, but, you know, part of that is here's the leash, put it around your neck and move down to uh, California because we want you around the corner to keep an eye on you. Uh, there's money that you can get from New York and Boston and all sorts of other places. And yet there's been some terrifically successful companies operating in Canada, which is at the beginning seemed to be a little bit like, why are you still here? Uh, I know of a quantum computing company in Vancouver, all of their clients are American. So why are they still in, in Vancouver? So the question becomes, can you, I mean, I, I get, the answer is obviously yes, you can be successful if you stay in Canada, if you take a look at the successful companies that exist in Canada. But if you're a young startup and you get that call from the Valley, at what point do you say, adios, Canada, I'm moving down south? And what point do you say, no, I'm going to try and make it here? Uh, another great question. That's uh, something I get asked a lot because I, I moved, I, I answered that call. I moved down to Silicon Valley. Uh, we went, my wife and I said we'd go for a year and try it out, and six years later we haven't left. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, it's, I think the question comes back to, can you build a successful company anywhere in the world? Because I know there's people tuned in from all over the world right now listening. And it, it's become much easier and much more viable to do that anywhere in the world now, or almost anywhere in the world. And I think some of the tools that we now have at our disposal uh, make that very possible. But what I would encourage you is understand where your customers are 
and where your key partners are going to be. And if you're, you can be anywhere, but make sure that you're ready to get on an airplane to go make things happen. <laughs> because you're, with D-Wave in Vancouver, they're spending a lot of time on airplanes uh, with, with JPL and with yeah. uh, uh, their, their key customers in the US. So you can build it almost anywhere. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't go to Silicon Valley if that's something that interests you and you want to try it out for a while, because there's an incredible experiences that you're going to have. You're going to see a different sort of culture than what I've, than what I've seen in any other place in the world uh, that's special to that area. But you don't have to make it permanent. In fact, these days, uh, I distribute my teams. So I have my product team and everybody that's building our technology is in Calgary. And my business team, we're, we're in the entertainment industry these days, so my business team is in LA. I have a small team in San Francisco, uh, and that works very well for us. Other people are the, have the philosophy that you must have everybody together in one place. Uh, I think that's less critical these days. You, have to, you want to get the best people, if the best people want to be in Kingston, or they want to be in Hawaii, <laughs> then find a way to make that work. Yeah. And uh, now as far as moving to the valley and what, what's, what's the siren call, uh, for me, it was because I had to spend so much time down there, I was never home. Yeah. And I have three kids, and I wanted to make sure that, uh, and I wasn't seeing enough of them, and they weren't seeing enough of me. I thought, well, let's have an adventure. And, and the spark for me was some very good friends of ours moved to Santiago for three years. And I thought, that's really interesting. You know, if I was going to relocate and if our family was going to go have an adventure somewhere, where would that be? And given what I do for a living, it was a good fit. Yeah. And it doesn't mean I won't come back here or I might not move somewhere else in the future. Uh, so I would say be where you want to be. If you're not there, get there. <laughs> but you can be here. But you brought up an interesting question, and that is when you said you didn't see enough of your family. Uh, entrepreneurs face this all the time, and it's the old question, you know, the work-life balance. Uh, is there such a thing as a balance between work and life, or is it something else? I think there absolutely is. And in fact, when you see an unbalanced entrepreneur the one that's pouring 20 hours a day into their project and sleeping under their desk, it's not healthy and it's not sustainable. Uh, so I, when, I, when I see an entrepreneur exhibiting those characteristics, I tell them, your investors don't want that, your family doesn't want that, you really don't want that. Make the time. Uh, and I've seen something else which is really, uh, it's probably a universal human characteristic, uh, but once you, it's, once you see it, you can address it, which is uh, the grass is always greener. So I was finding at various stages, when I was with my family, I was feeling very guilty I wasn't working on my project. And when I was working on my project, I was feeling very guilty I wasn't spending time with my family. Uh, and I think there was, I, I saw that somewhere in the agenda there was a speaker going to talk about mindfulness and being present. And that's one of the big lessons I learned, which is when I'm with my family, I am totally with my family. And I am not thinking about my project or wishing that I was working on it. And when I'm at work, I don't feel guilty about the fact that I'm working on what I'm doing. And once I came to peace with that, everything seemed to fall into place much better. Uh, we have, uh, but you definitely need to rest, recharge, and balance your life if you're going to be effective as an entrepreneur. 